Yes, we have a God who sustains us in His grace and He sustains us by faith. I'm actually ending the series this morning. And I'm talking about the God who sustains His mission. The God who sustains His mission. You know, your friends, your family matter. And Jesus wants us to see the world completely differently from how we normally see it. Where we begin to understand that evangelism is at the very heart of Christianity. Think back for a moment. When, when Jesus met the very first disciples he was ever going to reach, what did he say to them? I will make you follow me and I will make you fishers of men. His last words before he ascended to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit was, go into all the world, preach the gospel, teach them to obey everything I've ever commanded you. It is very much in the heart of Jesus that the reason he came was to bring change. The reason he came was to save a desperate world, most of whom didn't even know they needed saving. And so his first disciples, going to all the world. His last disciples, going to all the world. His goal is, he says, I've come that I might destroy the works of the enemy. I've come that they may have life to the full. And there's no way anybody on planet earth can understand the fullness of the gospel. That Jesus came to earth to die the death of a cross for the sake of sinners as an atonement to satisfy the wrath of God. You cannot understand that if someone doesn't tell you. And if you don't open a Bible. You can't sit on an island somewhere and look at the glory of creation according to Romans chapter 1 and figure out that someone had to die for your sin. Someone had to tell you. And you here this morning because somebody somehow told you. In the previous meeting, we had seven or eight people, I think seven, come and respond to the gospel this morning. And besides one guy I've seen before, I hadn't seen any of those people ever before. And I'm telling you, although we haven't seen them, someone has. Someone's been talking to them. Someone's been reaching out to them. And the point I want to get to this morning is to remind you that the church today is on a rescue, if you like. It is on a mission to tell the world about the truth of Jesus Christ. However, we know that fewer than 1% of Christians ever go tell someone else about Jesus. And so I want to tell you this morning that God, however, does sustain his mission. If you and I simply view the world the way it's seen on TV, secular media, public education, movies, evangelism wouldn't make any part of our lives. Eternal salvation and damnation are not part of popular discussion and comments at the moment. You don't go into conversations where people are asking the questions, why am I here? How did I get you? Is there a God? Am I accountable? What happens when I die? But they are still the absolute core issues facing planet Earth. That every single person, when they breathe their last, will go and face eternal judgment and then an eternal destiny. We know this, but it's no longer part of popular conversation. You want to know how much secular culture has got into us? Ask the question, how great is your and my burden and priority for evangelism? We're churches that even talk about it. Reality has shifted from what's of critical importance to entertainment, TV, and distraction, sports, hobbies, etc. We'd far rather spend reams of time and effort and concentration on stuff that actually doesn't matter. But the big issues aren't being discussed. We want to move each one reach one beyond a slogan to something where you and I understand that God is sustaining a mission on planet earth. And when that mission is fulfilled, Jesus Christ will come back. I believe God wants to restore a sense of urgency back to his church where we understand why we're here. Give me some examples of how Jesus tried to do it. In John's gospel, I'm going to read you a couple of stories quickly. John tells us how Jesus goes to the temple in John chapter 2. He makes a whip. And he drives all the money changers out of the temple in Jerusalem. When the money makers ask him, for what, under what authority are you doing this? What, is, what does he say to them? Verse 19, he simply says, destroy this temple, I will raise it again in three days. He had said, did you not know that my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? That under what authority do you do what you do? He says, you know what? Destroy this temple, I'll build it in three days. Now they know it took 46 years to build. What did Jesus mean? Change the way you look at your world. The temple is a place where you think you can sell goats and pigeons and connect. It's coming to an end. It's going to be replaced by another temple. And that other temple, Jesus said, is going to be himself. The place where people will meet God going into the future is going to be in the person of Jesus Christ. No longer in a place. 
Next thing, Jesus goes with Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes at night and says to Jesus, who are you? And in John 3, 3, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now, obviously, it's quite a statement. And so Nicodemus says the first thing like most of us do, the first thing that comes out of his mouth. How can a man be born when he's old? Surely he can't enter a second time into his mother's room to be born. Jesus is trying to get Nicodemus to see things in a totally radical way. There are spiritual realities that Nicodemus is not seeing at all. And until he sees those spiritual realities, entering the kingdom of God will make no sense to him. There are spiritual realities that Jesus lives and breathes. The big reasons of the universe. But people just don't get it. Then in chapter 4, Jesus meets a woman at the well. The Samaritan woman. And he challenges her worldview. In verse 10, he says, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She doesn't get it. She says, Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Jesus is trying to move her to see the, another world in the world she's living in right now. I don't want to go there, but for some of you who've watched The Matrix, blue pull or red pull, the world you're living in, there's another real world that's happening as real, if not more real, than the one you think you're living in. Um, Jesus wants her to see beyond a world of water, thirst, desire, and satisfaction. He needs her to understand that there's a world that, that the church can offer through Jesus that no one else can. When people see a temple made of bricks, a birth with blood and pain, when they see water from a well, they need to see a man who is a temple. They need to see a birth by the Spirit, and they need to see water that satisfies forever. Later on in the chapter, chapter 6, Jesus miraculously feeds 5,000 people from five loaves, of five loaves of bread and two fish. Why? What's he trying to show them? He's trying to show them that he can supernaturally get into the same circumstances and he can feed multitudes with the exact same amount. Because there's power from heaven that can nourish you way beyond what just bread can. And then Jesus says there in, in John 6 verse 27, do not work for food that spoils. I tell you the truth, you're looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and you had your full. They were stuck in a limited worldview. Friends, you and I will never ever have a heart for evangelism until we begin to see the world as Jesus sees it. The world is a desperate place full of lonely lost people who are in desperate need for Jesus. And you and I, without going crazy, need to live in a world where we understand, okay, Lord, you've called us to a place of evangelism. What do we do? How do we do it? What do you, how would you help us, Lord, as a church to follow you and make fishes of men and follow you and go into all the world and preach the gospel? How would we do that? The answer uh, he gives us is in John chapter 4, if you want to turn there. It's my text for this morning, John chapter 4, and I'm going to read from verse 31. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone else have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months more than the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. We're trying to explain that in the next 20 minutes, Max, and we're done. Anyone heard of William Wilberforce? Hey? Absolutely fantastic British Christian politician who labored 200 years ago for the overflow for the overthrow of the slave trade in Britain. He was responsible for the world demise in organized slavery. He's well known for that, but what he's not well known for is his personal evangelism. And my thing this morning is I want to talk to you quickly. When you start with evangelism, it starts with personal evangelism. How do I reach someone for Christ? Now, William Wilberforce was convinced that people were in great need of personal faith in Jesus and that they needed to give their allegiance to Jesus. It's not just enough to put your faith in him. You then need to give your allegiance to him, and you need to follow him wholeheartedly. So what he did was he made a list of his friends, people he was 
witnessing to about Jesus with ideas on how to approach them. And then he developed what he called launches, like to launch something, launches. Openings in conversation with friends to launch into a conversation about Jesus and Christianity. And all he said was, you know what? There's got to be common ground between me and the other person. Where can I start a conversation on anything that eventually takes it round to talking about Jesus or Christianity? Personal evangelism is key. Woman at the well, Jesus talks about water. Nicodemus, he talks about a new birth. When there's a whole crowd that need ministry, he talks about food and fish. What are the things that you and I have we got that we can talk to people about? So Jesus is trying to help us to say, when you talk to people, start with what you have. Don't start in the stratosphere. Start with what you have. So the first thing is focus on personal evangelism. I'll go there just now. Second thing is this, a promise from the Lord that when you evangelize other people, you literally nourish your own soul on God. You nourish your own soul on God. In John 4, 31, Jesus has finished talking to a Samaritan woman. She's gone back to town with a totally different view of the world. The disciples come back from the same town and they want to give him food. I read it to you now, now. I'm going to read it again. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. He said to them, I have food to eat you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. A conversation happens between Jesus and his disciples where they come to him and they say, Jesus, it's either lunchtime or past lunch, eat something. Jesus looks at them and says, I have been eating. I just told you my food is to do the will of my father and to accomplish his work. I have just spent the last half an hour speaking to a Samaritan woman about salvation. And I tell you what, I'm full. I've eaten. And of course, these guys miss it altogether. Well, who gave him food? Was it healthy? Did they wash their hands? Who's taking our job away from us? Are we supposed to be taking care of him? They're concerned about the nourishment that comes from eating. Jesus is concerned about the nourishment that comes from loving. He got filled. He got satisfaction and strength from witnessing to a woman about the all-satisfying water of life. And I want to suggest to you this morning that when we give ourselves to the work of personal evangelism, God pours life into our souls. When you give life away to others, God pours life into you. The more you share God, the more you enjoy God. Have you ever seen these people that are rabid evangelists? They want to tell anything that moves about Jesus. Have you ever seen those people? Have, do they, are they upset? Are they ever backsliding? Are they ever miserable? Have you ever noticed the people who share Jesus the most, who are most excited to talk about their faith, are also the people who are usually the happiest, regardless of circumstances, because they're filled with him. They can't wait to talk about it. Just think for a moment. I want to digress for a moment. Have you ever seen an oak who now meets a chick and then he goes to tell his friends about the chick? I met this chick, and the guys talk, and they puff themselves up, and they get a bit of a flushed face, and tell their mates about it. Now, I've only seen this on movies, but have you ever seen girls who want to, you've met a guy, and now they want to tell their other chicks about this guy? And it's a third, and it's a third degree, and they're talking, and they're blushing, and photos are out, and they're all excited, and this and that, and they feel good even in the talking. There's something about sharing your faith. when you, And you know what? All you have to share with someone is what he's done for you. Your story. How has he changed your life thus far? What's he done to you that you can go and share with others? One of my favorite verses along this, if I want to help people through, is Philemon, verse 6. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Jesus said it's literally food for me when I share my faith with others. I want to ask you, who's, right now, who's the most excited person in the room? I wish I had a mirror and I could reflect on what some of you look like when I'm trying to preach. Or you're pretending to take notes, meanwhile. I mean, honestly, who's the most excited person here? Sit down. <laughs> okay, you're excited. But... But here's my point. I'm the most excited because I'm sharing a story. I shared this just now. 
to you actually, to Eric, I said, do you check what happened in the Bull Sharks game? Remember, it's like, no, I didn't see it. I said, it's an arm wrestle for those of you who saw it yesterday. 27, 27, T2 teams packed with Springboks. They're not giving an inch to each other. It's an arm wrestle of note. The game goes 80 minutes. It goes into the 83rd minute and Northern Transvaal do what they've done for 100 years. They get a fly half in nose and a drop kick. And they win by a drop kick in the 83rd minute. I got animated. Why? Because I was there. No, I watched it on TV, I mean. I was, I, I was actively involved. Then the storm is one. Whatever. Because I didn't watch. No, I heard it was brilliant, but I didn't watch. I actually forgot that it was even on. And my point is that you get, when you start to share your faith with people, you get excited about what Jesus has done for you. Could it be that when you join your hand to God's most important work, there's a special provision of grace from the Lord. Because he says, you know what? I sent my son for this planet. And now you're putting your hand up to go and share that news. I think there's something special. So how does the Lord help us? The next verse is John 4, verse 35 to 38. Do you not say four more months than the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the reaper draws his wages. Even now, he harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you've not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Third point, Jesus deals with our expectations. When you want to share your faith with someone, your expectations. When you normally harvest, you've got sowing and you've got harvest, there's a time interval, right? We know you share your faith, you wait, wait, something's going to happen or not. You share, you wait, 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 something's going to happen. What Jesus is saying here, do you not say there are now four months till harvest? In other words, you think there's unchangeable laws, don't have any expectancy because it's either sowing or it's reaping. Jesus says, no, I want you to change your expectancy. I want you to lift up your eyes. I want you to be on the lookout. The fields are ripe. They are ready for harvest. Jesus had just been sowing seed of the word in the last half hour to a Samaritan woman. What did she do when she heard the word? She immediately goes back to her village and says, hey, I want to tell you all something about someone who knows my whole life and my whole future. I want to tell you about him. She, he sowed the word to her. She's now going and sowing the word. What are the disciples doing? They've just come back with lunch. They're not even there. So Jesus is saying this. I, here I am. There's a woman with a need. I minister to this need. I sow towards her. She now has gone to a village and she's gone to tell them about me. By the way, boys, where have you just come from? That exact same village. But your expectation was down. You're going there. Here we go. We get food. We come back. He says, you didn't even lift your eyes. And she's gone back to the very, very village you come from. And you couldn't pick up that that village was ripe for harvest because you weren't looking. Your expectation was totally different. It wasn't where it should be. In the realm of evangelism, lift up your eyes. Look, see what God is doing. Can I tell you, there is always people or peoples ready for harvest. Because God is doing things in their lives that we're unaware of. The fourth thing God shows us is some are sowers and some are reapers. The, the pressure is off. Jesus says, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. He had sowed. Jesus sowed to this woman. This woman sows back to her village. The apostles, the disciples, are standing on years of prophets and writings who've sown into Israel. And he's saying, a harvest is about to come. I'm sending you out to reap a harvest, not even sow seed, because it's been done for all these times. And I want to remind you, from today on, if ever you think of reaching someone for Jesus, think of a lemon tree. Okay. Because I have one at home, and I looked at it yesterday. They, they harvest in winter, not summer. And I went yesterday, and some are green, some are almost yellow, some are yellow. And when you go, you go, you take it, and you begin to pull like this. And when you pull, if it's not ready, it's not ripe, let it go. Stay near, but just let it go. Don't bruise it. Don't hurt it. Don't try and rip the thing off. 
Don't try and pull it off because if it's not ready, it's going to die. You don't go to someone you've never met in a shopping center and say, hey, you know about Jesus? If you don't take your last breath right now, you're going to have the fire of hell if you've got your marshmallows. You don't start a conversation with somebody who doesn't know Jesus like that. It also doesn't help to wear suits with ties and certain things and knock on doors and say, can I tell you about Jesus? Can I tell you about Jesus? This, it doesn't work. All right? You go and you pull. And I tell you, when the fruit's ripe, it comes off easily like that and it's ready. Because there's a work that God is doing in people's lives that bring them to that place. Are you okay? I want to say this about it. It's a joyful work. Evangelism is a joyful work. But it's not an easy work. In verse 36, Jesus said, Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests a crop for eternal life. So that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, says, Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And I want to tell you, even if you're in sowing season, you're trying to reach someone, you're trying to share your faith with somebody, please remember, God has ordained that this is a moment where you're either sowing or you're going to be reaping. And you might just be that person who shifts someone else along the journey without messing it up for them by in love responding well and responding carefully. God wants this to be a joyful work, but it's not an easy work and it's not a safe, safe work. You can be discouraged when you want to share your faith with people, when it's sowing time. I want to use the example of a friend of mine who's here. He's outside. I hope he doesn't sort me out afterwards. There was a time I tried to reach a friend of mine, and we both ride for the same motorbike club. Now, that's really just brought it down. It's narrowed it down somewhat. And I remember we met, and he said, brother, we both sit on council. Now it's come even further down. And he said to me, I want to tell you something. He said, you stay in your lane, and I'll stay in mine. I know you're a preacher. That's your story. You stay in your lane, I'll stay in mine, and we just do what we do for the club. Then that friend of mine, he got very sick. We'd done a ride or so together, and on a, on a, I think it was a Monday morning or something, I felt I was having a prayer time during the first hectic COVID, and I felt the Lord said, go visit him. So I sent a message to his dad, who's sitting over there, and I said, I want to go visit him. Do you think I can? Well, it's COVID, who knows? Try whatever, whatever, whatever. I arrive at, at, at uh, Donald Gordon Hospital in the height of COVID. I'm surprised there's no guns and armed guards and dogs running around. And I walk in, and do you know no one asked me a question? I just walked in. I put my hand out, they sprayed it. I went to the counter. I said, where's this guy there? They gave me the room number. I walked with the doctor up in and I walked straight into his room, talked to him about Jesus and he gave his life to the Lord. There and then. But we'd had a bit of time before where I said, hey, but, uh, he said, hey, hey, just understand, you stay in your lane and I'll stay in my lane. Easy to get a little bit discouraged. Easy to feel, well, I don't know. But if you truly appreciate someone and you love that person, you keep your doors open and you wait for God to do something. And then when the Spirit of God gives you a moment, like I had, I phoned, went, I don't know what's going to happen. I arrived at the hospital fully expecting the hospital to tell me, no, you can't come in. You know, like they were like, it was ridiculous. And it's a top hospital, Donald Gordon. I just waltzed in straight to the guy's room. I still don't know how it happened. He had been in intensive care, high care for 10 days. He had just come out into the room. I speak to him right moment. God visits us. Bang, he responds to the gospel. Sowing and reaping, the whole mix mash is all up to the Lord. You just got to trust him. So as we look, as I want to close now, as we look to him who sustains the, the, the mission, give you some practical things. Isaiah 52 verse 7 says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. But here's my question. How are we going to hear the text that answers that is Romans 10, verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they haven't heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And I want to tell you, you were all sent. Every single Christian has been sent 
into the harvest fields of the world. So now you get excited and say, okay, as we close this, I'm, I, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm in. How are we going to do this? Interestingly, when a person gets saved, have you noticed the last people they ever go and reach are the people closest to them? Rather get on a mission trip to Africa than go to your friends and your neighbors who actually know you. Have you noticed? Sometimes the very people getting on the bus to come with us to go and preach there have never preached here. Never found a gap. Can I tell you actually the way the Lord has engineered it? That the people that you should reach the quickest are the people closest to you. Let me show you. John 1, 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and said, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come here, replied, and you'll see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the 10th hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was find his brother Simon and tell him we have found the Messiah that is the Christ and he brought him back to Jesus. Skip a line the next day. Jesus decides to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, I don't know, I've lost my place, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathaniel. And told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. I want to show you, one guy reached his friend and the next guy reached his brother because that, that is the natural flow. We sometimes shy away from reaching those nearest to us, but actually it makes most sense to reach them. So can I, in one minute or two minutes, just give you five quick tips. When it comes to sharing your faith, with somebody near you. Ryan, is that you there? Oh, look, there. there's the guy. Yes, you've got a handsome face. I wish I could show you everyone who you are to show. I'm not lying about this story. You know, I told you that mates of mine is in the writing club. We're both on council together and how he's like, you stay in your lane, I'll stay in mine. And then God saves him. There's the punk right there. And his life is transformed and his wife and their children, and they're here, and his dad's here, and his, his brother-in-law's there, and God is just doing stuff. Let me say this when you want to share your faith with someone. Are you ready? If you share with someone close to you, you understand their environment and their culture. You do. It makes conversation and assumptions so much easier. Because you get them. I shared last week at the 10 o'clock at this meeting about my other neighbor. Remember, the one who lived next door to me who someone told him on a Sunday that he's got problems in his life at a Brian's, doesn't even know him and says, your neighbor's a pastor and you need to go to him and his wife and they're going to pray with you and the curses are going to be lifted and darkness is going to be come out of your life and all this stuff. He's freaked out. He phones us the next morning. We go across and see him, Vanessa and myself. We lead him to the Lord. A whole lot of stuff happens. He's hardly ever missing church. Last week, his grand, his mom and his mom's boyfriend come to church. The boyfriend and the grand give their lives to the Lord. Granny Omar was back here this morning at the 8 o'clock, she's like, hallelujah, I'm really enjoying this. She says, where is there a cell group for me? So I told her, while I'm busy talking, someone over here gets a conversation. And then she, he said, his mom's going to be at the next meeting. Is she here? Huh? Yes, there you are. There she is with the boyfriend who gave his life to the Lord last year. So, folks, sorry, I don't need the claps. What I'm trying to point out to you is these things are real. There they're sitting, right behind the other hook I just reached. It's not a lie. And then a couple of months ago, I go to do a wedding. Where's Kurt? Uh, where, where's, where's Bakewell? I saw him. There he is. Kurt and Ange, right there. I go do, we go do their wedding. We're on the dance floor. And these two cousins, that, that only make big people. And uh, the prop, my old rugby prop, Brett, is there. And, and Mike, my old lock partner, is there. And even Kurt, they, they only, the Bakewells only make big people. And we're on the dance floor. And you know what it's like on the dance floor. And the music's going. And you know what happens when English people dance? And the Afrikaners, are they sailing away and they're doing their thing? And the English are. And I remember I leaned over on the dance floor and I said to them, to both his cousins, I said, When are you guys going to get back to church? Because we've played rugby, we've been in the trenches together, we've sent the stuff, we've done our. I said, Boys, when are you going to reach? When are you just going to come on, man? Let's get back to church. 
They're like, okay, the next week, Sunday, Brett comes, gets saved. Next week, he brings his wife, she gets saved. Next week, the kids come, they get saved. Now, th- this morning at the other meeting, the whole flipping line's taken up with these people. And they've all responded to the gospel one by one. Because you know the culture, you know the people. It's so easy for you to speak. You remember that guy, um, that girl who did the ladies do for us? Justine Wimble, who shared at the ladies' event. So we went, her husband's got brain cancer, terminal brain cancer. So we flew down on the Monday. I just felt God said, go visit him. Flew down on the Monday. We spent Monday, Monday morning, Monday afternoon, Monday late lunch, Monday evening with different crowds of people. Tuesday morning, we go to a little coffee shop thing in Durban. They don't seem to work there because it's a Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock and there's like two or three things and they're all full of people. I'm like, in Joburg, we're like earning a salary. I don't know what those people are doing. Anyway, I'm sitting there and it's all neat and nice and this one oak walks in. I mean, he's built like this. He's got a cap on, tattooed from here to here. You can just check. He's the one oak. He walks in like this. I thought immediately, that's my kind of guy. Right there. So he actually walked past at that table and greets Mark. So I said, Mark, do you know him? He said, no, there are Funeral for someone, and he was the best friend I, I saw him there. He's, a, he's actually a boxing coach, and this and this and this. I said, oh, is it? I said, I hear him. I can scratch him. So I get up. I go to him. I said, dude, I think I know you. So he says, well, where from? He gets up, and he's like, he says, he's you, Joe. He says, where from? So I said, I don't know. He says, where? He said, I said, but I'm not from here. He says, well, where are you from? I said, Eden Valley. He goes, the Vale. So immediately I knew this oak is our kind of guy. And uh, turns out he was with Rocky in the... He worked for one of the Hells Angels in the tattoo clubs. You might know him, Trevor. Right, Trevor. Meet this up. What are you doing? And I'm at a church evangelist. This is Mark. When you go to church, put next thing we're finding rock and we're sharing photographs and selfies. And Mike is his buddy and we're connecting and we're chatting and all this. Because there's an affinity with people when they're your kind of people. It makes it much easier to share your faith with your kind of people. By that, I simply mean your culture, your environment. The people who live where you live. That was my very long point. Number two. You have a bridge and you already carry a credibility with them. They'll listen to you before they listen to a stranger. Because they know you. You're not scary. You're not frightening. You can, and you, the, the limit of your story is I just want to tell you what's happened in my life. That's it. That's testimony. I want to tell you because Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Jesus is the one we testify about. Can I just tell you what's happened in my life? They know you. They know you're a skabenga. They know everything about you. So when you start to share, look, I am who I am, but I want to tell you, I've put faith in Jesus. I can't fix me, but I've put my faith in him, and he's doing certain things in my life. It gives them a confidence. Number three, you actually care about them, and you want what's best for them. It's different to a stranger. With a stranger, you share your faith. They respond, they don't. You go, and already what it is, you know these evangelists, they come back, it's notches on a belt. Come back from a thing. We've got 500 saved. Well, how do you know that? Well, they put their hands up. And then? Then they prayed. Yeah, then? Now they're saved. Rubbish, man. But the Bible says, you know them by their fruit. And I want to tell you, it takes a long time for a tree to pop up and start bearing fruit. I don't start saying straight away that I saved. You don't know. That's why we say here we have, we've had responses to the gospel. And it's easier to, to get an email that says, hey, you must put money into this organization. They've seen 10,000 saved. Well, how do you know? Can you show me your stats? How did you work that out? But when you have friends that you care about, you find a way. Number four, you don't have to take all the new truth you know about Jesus across the bridge at once. You'll have time with them. You'll see them again. Be intentional. Make times. Make opportunities to see them again. Be nice. Reveal Jesus to them in ways that they would appreciate. Is that okay? I met a guy in the gym, and then, then, then his girlfriend came to our church, and she gave her life to the Lord. Such a small world. Next thing, when I meet him, I didn't even know that was her. Then we meet them again. Then she's pregnant before they're married. So Vanessa and I went to the baby dedication. Then they went and had another baby. Then they got married all the other way around. And then I went and I did the wedding. Flew down to the coast, did the wedding for them. Then did the other baby dedication. Um, just trying to administrate the love of Jesus in their lives. Last night, I get a message from the, this guy we've been trying to reach for a long time, from his old lady, who said, you know what? She's never stepped foot in church as far as I know. And she sent me a message saying, what are your times I want to come to your church? I'm like, why? She said, no, it's at this time. Something's happening. I've got a bit of a cold. Can I come from next week, please? I'm like, of course you can. Do I need to sign register? No, 8 and 10 just arrived. I'm telling you, God will bring people if we just show them we care. Stay real. 
Keep the doors open. Serve them with the love of Jesus. Don't always condemn them. And then lastly, best point of all, both Andrew with his brother Peter and Philip with his friend Nathaniel simply brought them to Jesus and left the work of conviction and the work of revelation to the Holy Spirit. They didn't try to change them. They let God do it. When you bring your friends to church and people respond to the gospel, can I tell you, it's because Jesus gets a hold of them. You can create an environment. Let the Lord do the rest. Stand with me, please. Thank you so much for being a part of our meeting today. Um, can I just ask two things? The first is, if today the, the message has in any way been useful to you, would you mind just maybe liking it or putting uh, perhaps a statement down or a comment down that we can know and how the ministry has helped you? Maybe a, a thumbs up, maybe you can subscribe to the channel, do whatever, just so we can know what impact this message may be having on you. And secondly, you may be someone who's saying, Greg, I hear you. And this, this, this hope that Jesus has for us can come into my heart and it can change me. But the reality is that I don't even know if I know Jesus. I want to say two things to you right away. The first is he's near you right now. The Bible says if you believe in your heart that he is the Lord and if you confess him with your mouth, you will be saved. Which means you just need to, where you are, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, even now. And just say, Lord, here I am. I recognize who you are. I confess my sin to you. I acknowledge you as Jesus Christ, the Lord of all, the Son of the living God. And I want to follow you. I want to become a disciple of yours. I want to, I want to give my life to you, Lord. And you can pray that prayer right now between you and the Lord. Secondly, you can get hold of us. Um, you can see the telephone number. You can get hold of us and say, hey, I've given my life to the Lord. Can you help me from here on out? And we could either send you some material. We can uh, put you in touch with a really good church near you. If you live in our area, you can come to us. You can follow us on YouTube. But it is good to get connected into the family of God, to get connected into a local church, that your life changes being surrounded with the family of God. Please stay in touch. God bless you.